Our scripture lesson on this Remembrance Day Sunday is taken from Paul's letter to the Philippian church, a letter that he wrote while in jail, in prison, in Rome, and it's the first nine verses of Philippians chapter 4. Let me read these verses for you. Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. Paul writes from prison. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind or agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, Put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Thus endeth the reading of God's holy word. Our visual this morning is this. It's a stick. It's a stick. Memory is a wonderful gift, isn't it? The ability to uh, reminisce, to recall, to remember. It's a gift of God to be used for our pleasure and benefit. Mine gets worse all the time, as I suspect some of yours does. But memory is a great source of encouragement and comfort and support. Seems like the older we get, the more we do it. Sit around and talk about the good old times. My kids and grandkids hate it. As soon as we get older, it's often the first thing to go, isn't it? Somebody on in years once said, I have a great memory, it's just very short. You may have heard the story of the 80-year-old couple that was having problems remembering things. So they decided to go to their doctor and make sure nothing was wrong with them. When they arrived at the doctor's office, they explained to the doctor about the problems they were having with their memory. After checking the couple out, the doctor told them that they were physically okay, but might want to start writing things down, kind of making notes to help them remember things. The couple thanked the doctor and left. Later that night, while watching television, the old man got up from his chair. And his wife asked him, where are you going? He said, I'm going to the kitchen. She asked, will you get me a bowl of ice cream? He said, sure. Then his wife said to him, don't you think you should write that down so you can remember it? No, I can remember that, he said. Well, I also would like some strawberries on top. You'd better write that down because I know you'll forget that, his wife said. I can remember that. You want a bowl of ice cream with strawberries? She replied, well, I also would like some whipped cream on top. I know you'll forget that, so you better write it down. With irritation in his voice, he said, I don't need to write that down, I can remember it. So he went into the kitchen, and after about 20 minutes, with banging and crashing, he returned from the kitchen and handed her a plate of bacon and eggs. <laughs> she stared at the plate for a moment and said, You forgot my toast, why didn't you write it down? Ah. <laughs> uh. Been there, done that. <laughs> Memory's a wonderful thing until you start to lose it. Lest we forget, we will remember. Our phrases we hear attached to Remembrance Day. That's why anniversary services are so important. Why eulogies at funerals are so important. It's good for us to remember. Peter reminded us in his second letter when he said, So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them. I think it's right to refresh your memory. In memory we find insight and wisdom and understanding and inspiration for present living. Someone once said, most times 
We need not so much to be instructed as to be reminded. Somebody else said, you'll never know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. If we are unmindful of the past, we will be heedless about its possible future. That's true, isn't it? Today, Remembrance Day Sunday, is a day filled with memories. A day to remember and honor and pay tribute. And we're doing that. We wear poppies. We place wreaths. We have a service. We say prayers of thanksgiving and gratitude to God. We say words of tribute to those who fought and gave their lives to preserve and protect the freedoms and privileges and opportunities and benefits we enjoy in this wonderful land of Canada. We remember them, and it's a very important thing to do. It's good to remember in all of these ways. But most of us, after tomorrow is over, will put our poppies and wreaths away, we'll file our notes, go back to living our lives. And I wonder if one of our dead heroes or our veterans of the past that we honor today could come back and talk to us this morning. They'd thank us for remembering. They'd be grateful for the tributes. But I think they might remind us that memory has another purpose. And I think they might want to say to us, don't just remember, do something. Don't just remember, do something. Let the remembering motivate and challenge you to do your part to make our 21st century world, our country, our communities, our sphere of influence a better place. I think our veterans, if they were here and could speak to us, they'd say to us, don't just remember, do something. In these first few verses of Philippians chapter 4, Paul makes three little statements, each using the phrase, in the Lord, that give us some suggestions as to what we might do. Do you remember this church at Philippi is one of the churches Paul had founded years before on his missionary journeys. Paul, as you know, is writing from prison, soon to be martyred because of his Christian faith and ministry. And this first century Christian church was struggling to survive and grow and have influence in a very difficult environment that was extremely hostile to Christianity. In fact, the ruling Roman Empire of the day was in the process of trying to stamp it out through persecution, violence, and large-scale murder and martyrdom. And friends, in many parts of our world, the persecuted church faces these same things. On a lesser uh, part, probably without the violence and the martyrdom, we too face an assault on the church and the Christian faith in our modern society. It is hard to make a difference. It is hard to have an influence for God and for Christ. So Paul in this letter, if you know the letter to the book of Philippians, has done some reminiscing with them. He's expressed some great thanks. He's given tribute for their past ministry and their support of him and their great accomplishments. But then he writes, don't just remember the good times you've had in the past with Christ. What Christ has done for you and through you. Here are three ways you can continue to make a difference and have an influence in your world right now. And I want to use this stick as a symbol for what Paul suggests. And I want you to kind of see this little word behind me. S-T-I-C-K. And as you take that word home with you in this visual, remember these three points that Paul has given you. Someone defined authority as walk tall and carry a big stick. Not this kind of stick. Three sticks that Paul suggests to help make our world and our community and our individual sphere of influence a better place. The first is stick up. Stick up for what we believe in and what we know is right. Stick up for the values and principles our country was founded on. Paul says in verse 1, stand fast or stand firm in the Lord. This term that Paul uses is a military word used for a soldier to stand in there to a, in the shock of battle when the enemy was surging down upon them. Other Bible translations of this word stand firm. Don't waver. Stay on track. Stay true. Be reliable. Be able to be counted on. A person who is dependable and worthy of trust. The opposite of stand firm or not sticking up for what you believe in the Christian life is inconsistency. For a soldier it would mean to turn tail and bail 
and give in and surrender. Stand firm in the Lord. Stick up for what you believe. Three suggestions, I think, for what that might mean for us. First is live up to your convictions. As a Christ follower in a secular society, we're constantly bombarded, aren't we? By values and behaviors and lifestyles, moral and ethical choices that are contrary to what we believe that the Bible says. And the tendency sometimes is for there to be a bit of inconsistency between what we say and believe and stand for and what we actually do and how we actually behave. Nothing hurts the cause of Christ more, friends, and sets a bad example than publicly standing for one thing and then having your public actions show something else. Paul said in Romans 12 and 2, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Don't conform to the standards around you, another translation says. I may have told you this before, but it bears repeating. When I was a teenager in high school, my mom would give me a similar piece of advice. Every Friday or Saturday night as I was leaving home to go out with friends on a date or her parting shot was, Robert, don't forget who you are. Robert, don't forget who you are. Now, she wasn't afraid I'd forget my name or my address or who my parents were or where I lived. She meant that alone on a date or hanging out with some of my friends or at some party, I would lose sight of the values with which I'd been raised and give in or go along or try and fit in by engaging in some inappropriate behavior. Stand up for your convictions, she was saying. Be willing to swim upstream when it seems like most others are floating downstream. Second suggestion is just be consistent. If you name the name, walk the talk. If you call yourself a Christ follower, act like one. Be distinctively Christian. Let your beliefs and your behavior be consistent. Be the same on Monday as you are on Sunday. Be consistent. Third suggestion is pick the right company. I like this. Isn't it true? There are some people in whose company it is easy to do the wrong thing. There are also some other people when you're in their company it's easy to resist the wrong thing. Alone in our humanness we're weak and fickle and inconsistent. Stick up for what you believe. Stand firm in the Lord. The second suggestion that Paul says, the second step is stick together. Stick together. Cooperate. Pool your resources. Stand together in unity. Paul says, be of the same mind with each other in the Lord. Or the word, another translation says, agree with each other in the Lord. Verses 2 and 3. Paul was deeply concerned about this relationship between two women in the church at Philippi, Yodia and Syntyche. They were important and influential leaders in the church. We're not told the details, but obviously they had some kind of a falling out. They were at odds with each other, and it was causing disunity and dissension in the church and threatening the church's ministry. The news had reached Paul, and Paul says to them, Get along, K-A-M-U. Do you know what that stands for? K-A-M-U, kiss and make up. Have you heard that expression? Get over it. Work together. You need each other. Ask yourselves the question, people. Is the kingdom of God, is the cause of Christ, is the ministry of your church bigger than your gripe? Notice in verse 2 that Paul uses the word plead. He says plead with these women. He's very concerned. You see, Paul knows how destructive disunity and dissension can be in the church. And he's begging the whole church to get involved in helping to reconcile these two ladies. William Barclay once said, A quarreling church is no church at all. It's a church from which Christ has been shut out. Ouch. Here's the truth from my almost 40 years of ministry experience. Disunity and conflict in the church is like poison. Poisons the atmosphere. Poisons the effectiveness. It cripples, um, or it saps our energy and cripples our effectiveness. It destroys our witness and our example in the community. And it hurts the cause of Christ like nothing else. Agree with each other. 
get along, stick together. Folks, here's the truth, simply put. Not much of value or significant gets done in life by a bunch of individuals doing their own thing and pulling in dozens of different directions. Reminds me of the story of the husband and wife out one afternoon riding a bicycle built for two. On their ride they come to this long, steep hill. Took a great deal of effort and struggle for the two of them to complete what proved to be a very stiff climb. They finally make it to the top. The husband who's in front is huffing and puffing and almost passing out. Turns to his wife and says, man, that was some hard climb. She replied, it sure was. If I hadn't kept the brakes on all the way up, we would certainly have rolled backwards. <laughs> That's sometimes the way we work together though, isn't it? One pushing one way, one pulling the opposite way. One pedaling hard, the other trying to put the brakes on. Stick together. Agree with one another in the Lord. Pull together, work together, cooperate. Look out for each other. Let me quickly give you three ways we relate to each other around here. Three word pictures that describe what we do for and with each other. Friends, this is worth the price of the whole service. I love these three little word pictures. The first is face to face. Face to face. That's friend to friend. That's brother to brother. Sister to sister. Conveys the idea of friendship and fellowship and encouragement. The picture you get is two people sitting across from each other, sharing a cup of coffee and some conversation. Intimacy, sharing, caring, listening, growing together, face to face. The second picture is shoulder to shoulder, shoulder to shoulder, worker to worker, conveys the idea of togetherness, sharing a task, serving and working together. It's a picture of linking arms and tackling a task together. The picture of you on one end of the load and me on the other end of the load, picking it up and carrying it together, bearing together the weight of God's Word, shoulder to shoulder. The third one is back to back, back to back, warrior to warrior. Conveys the idea, doesn't it, of protection and defending each other, looking out for each other. I've got your back, you've got mine, as opposed to stabbing each other in the back. Stick together, agree with each other in the Lord, face to face, shoulder to shoulder, back to back. Finally, Paul says, stick to it, stick to it. Keep on keeping on, even when it's tough. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. If there's one thing that we Christians need to exemplify in our world, is that our joy and our happiness has nothing to do with our material possessions or our outward circumstances. The conditions both in Philippi where the Christians were being persecuted and in Rome where Paul was in prison under horrible conditions make this call to rejoice seem unreasonable. Rejoice always in spite of annoyance in spite of disagreement, in spite of hardship, in spite of persecution, in spite of opposition, in spite of crises, in spite of unfairness. These early Christians and Paul stuck with it. They persevered. They didn't give up and quit. Joy, rejoicing, happiness, contentment, they kept on keeping on. You know the soldiers who fought for us and won the war did so because they never quit when the going got tough. First time a bullet whizzed over their head, they didn't turn and run. When it got dangerous, when the conditions were less than ideal, when they received some opposition, when they were lonely and scared, when they got wounded and hurt, when it didn't work out the first or second or even tenth time, they didn't quit. They stuck to it and kept on advancing. How do you stick to it in tough times? Keep a good attitude. Verse 5 says, let your gentleness be evident to all. Keep a good attitude. Secondly, keep at it. Verse 6. Always, in every situation, you, those two sets of words are there. Always, in every situation. In other words, just keep at it. Number three, do what's right. Verse 8. Whatever is true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent or praiseworthy. Think about those things. 
Order your choices and your attitudes according to those things. Do what's right. And then number four, follow your leader. Verse 9, Paul says, Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. And Paul is sort of saying, friends, follow your leader. And who's your leader? Who's our ultimate leader? Jesus Christ. Follow your leader. Obey his commands. Follow his orders. Did you notice? Stand firm in the Lord. Agree with each other in the Lord. Rejoice with each other in the Lord. Where does our joy and rejoicing and happiness and contentment come from? Where does our ability to stick up and stick together and stick to it come from? Stand firm in the Lord. Consistency between what we say we believe and how we behave. Agreeing with each other in the Lord. Spirit of unity and cooperation and mutual care. Rejoicing always in the Lord. Joy, happiness, and perseverance in the face of adversity and tough times. It's as we dwell together in the Lord. Friends, let the remembering this weekend motivate and challenge you to do your part to make our 21st century world, our country, our communities, our sphere of influence a better place. Don't just remember. Do something. Remember the stick. Let us pray. Eternal God, loving Father, we thank you for the freedoms and opportunities and privileges and resources that we have in this great country of Canada, including the privilege we enjoy this morning to freely worship and to live our lives according to the Christian faith without the persecution and violence in much of our world. And we thank you for those whose sacrifices and even deaths have preserved it for us, those whom we pay tribute to this morning and will tomorrow. We thank you, though, Father, for the ultimate freedom, the greatest freedom of all, freedom from sin and guilt and eternal death through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Your word says we shall know the truth, and the truth will set us free. Father, take these memories and this remembering and may it motivate us to take these wonderful words from St. Paul, to stand firm in the faith, to be of the same mind with one another, the spirit of unity and cooperation, and then to stick to it, even when the going gets tough. May we be peacemakers in a world of strife and stress, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive now the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace today and every day. Amen. Amen.